Okie doke. Uh, <laughs> you want to like give people like uh, an introduction and yeah, yeah. Sure. Well, um, yeah, I'm Mason Hargrave. I'm a PhD student here at the Rockefeller University. Um, my, uh, I'm a, specifically, I'm a National Science Foundation graduate fellow um, that is for solid state physics. Luckily, they give me some flexibility. So a lot of my work is kind of applying techniques from solid state physics and math ideas from solid state physics into the world of neuroscience. Um, uh, my current work, sorry if it's sounding... I'm sorry if I'm, you can hear me adjusting here. My current work is largely in the world of um, depression, but I haven't done that much with that. I'm very new to that field, so I can't really talk authoritatively, although I can talk about certain things that I've heard and read and seen, um, but not. I, I really can't claim any expertise there. And a lot of my background is in um, astrophysics. Um, at bef before that, it was in, and then later, Origins of Life Biochemistry, which I would say is probably the thing I understand the best. So, um, yeah, that's basically, that's basically what I do. And I do a lot of research and I have my own, uh, podcast called solutions with Mason Hargrave. My first episode drops on Monday. Um, and then other than that, I, I tweet at my very small audience. <laughs> uh, uh, so, uh, that's at Mason Hargrave and you can find me on YouTube. Just my channel is Mason Hargrave. I'm not the one with the Trump picture. I have to get enough subscribers that I, DC, the guy with the Trump picture. I am the one with the picture of my face in cartoon form. Um, and yeah, other than that, I'm like, just like kind of, uh, yeah. So I don't know, um, background in math and physics and now I do bio. So that's basically it. I don't know. Dude, dude, right on. Give me one second. Oh, lighting smiting. All right, let's do it. Um, okay. So you, uh, are doing this, uh, podcast and did you say you were doing work in did you say depression yes yeah i i work on uh i, I well currently i am starting to work on data regarding human depression and then also um there should be some stuff coming down the pipe on um mouse um mouse mice depression so depression in mice but we use that as a way to figure out how like depression might be physically instantiated so that we can come up with you know drugs and drug targets for uh humans Okay. Okay. So is that like the, um, the stuff you hear of in the, in the textbooks, like is, uh, are you guys working around that stuff they did with the, you know, giving, uh, depriving rats of like, uh, social interaction or like cocaine, there was those experiments. So I don't know. So, how so, so there's, there's a ton of different ways to make a mouse depressed. <laughs> um, the one that I am most familiar with is the use of cortisol. So cortisol is a stress hormone you release when like when you're like really stressed, you release a lot of cortisol. Um, and uh, if you just keep injecting a mouse with cortisol over and over and you keep it just like really cortisoled up and stress it out all the time chemically, um, then you can um, just like make it depressed long term. It'll get it'll develop depression um, through being stressed for a really long time. Which you know you you may imagine has some important relevance to humans' current experience, uh, you know, and people getting being kind of constantly stressed by work, and then getting depression, and depression rates increasing. Like it, uh, this may or may I, I can't know for sure, but this may or may not be a very common pathway for people developing depression, which people like to call burnout. Okay. Okay. So it's it's it's. Uh, giving rats stress to the point where they they're they're they burn out yeah yeah they're experiencing the rat equivalent of burnout i wonder how yes. how long you would have to keep a mouse in a maze where they couldn't get to the cheese before they experienced like, well you see it's 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 not a, it's not a single instantiation instantiation of stress it's consistent and repetitive day-to-day -day stress it's like being stressed day in and day out without remission that really causes this damage and the damage in particular takes the form of the loss of these things called dendritic spines now this is not my research as i clarify this is the research of my 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 advisor or my, my ostensive advisor. We still have to figure this out. He hasn't gotten me a swipe card into the Cornell labs yet. Uh, I know I work at Rockefeller and Cor like between Rockefeller and I do data for stuff at Cornell, but um, it's, 
I haven't gotten into, I haven't actually gotten the swipe card for Cornell yet. And that's mostly because of bureaucratic COVID slowed down things that like, I don't want to get into on air, but, uh, <laughs> but basically um, I think uh, th this is the work of, uh, of, of Connor Liston. And he showed that um, this constant cortisol stress ends up destroying these things called dendritic spines, um, which are, you, you know, a cell is a, a neuron is called as the, um, the dendrite, cell body and then the axons which spread which spread so so a signal comes in through the dendrite launches up through the arm and then it launches up into the cell body and then gets spread or propagated through various outcroppings to other neurons dendrites so at the end of each of these is another dendrite to another neuron um and so they're so they branch and split that way um, and so the, the dendri dendritic spines are these little spines that are all over the, the all, all over the dendrite. Um, that is where the, which is where the um, synapses are. So that's where, that's where another, another dendrite, sorry, an, an axon connects onto the dendrite, uh, uh, you know, on each of these dendritic spine locations. So when you get rid of these dendritic spines, you're like shutting down neural communication between different neurons. And so when you think about like, oh, the neurotransmitter gets released, it's happening at an axon, it's happening between an axon and a dendritic spine, or like at the location of a dendritic spine. And um, when those dendritic spines go away, you basically, in essence, are losing the connection between those neurons. Um, and it looks as if constant cortisol um, actually, uh, you know, exposure um, actually causes the loss of dendritic spines. So being stressed all the time actually like makes you lose neural connections. Oh, okay. Okay. And is, is, is your research like, uh, or any of the research that you're associated with, is it like, uh, or is your research like, uh, therapeutic at all? Like, like well, trying to well, certainly one thing we'd be interested in looking at, um, and our, is, is the, our drug targets, right? So what type of drug targets can exist? Um, and what a drug target is. And so one, one, one drug that has seemed to be effective is ketamine. Um, ketamine uh, regrows those dendritic spines. Um, about 50% of the ones that have been destroyed by cortisol, by what is known as a stress regimen, I think. Um, it was, was, that's what you, that's a fancy way to call uh, like constantly injecting cortisol. It's called a stress regimen. Um, and and uh, it basically regrows 50% of those dendritic spines that are lost through the stress regimen. And um, it, by, by regrowing, we mean another dendritic spine shows up within, I think, two to five micrometers um, of where a spine was before. Um, and then uh, as you move from there, uh, you have... Um, so yeah, yeah. So 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 th this is this is what the, you know these people did before I showed up. I just I really want to em emphasize that because uh, <laughs> I'm not taking credit for this. Um, uh, but but the the uh, so so it shows up to five. Um, you know between between two to five. I think about one two to five millimeter micrometers away from where a spine previously was. And then there's another fifty percent on top of that that grows. Um, that grows in new locations, um, kind of new spots for dendritic spines to form. Um, and then after that, it just looks as if the mice uh, lose their depressive symptoms. Um, uh, you, you may say, and you say, well, how do you know it's as a result of those dendritic spines forming? And the answer is that um, when you remove, when you use like a special optogenetic method, which is like a laser, um, you're able to like laser off all these different dendritic spines uh, very precisely. The ones that, just the ones that formed, not the, uh, not the other ones, so the new ones. And when you laser off just the new ones, um, they get depressed again. So it seems as if these dendritic spines are in fact causal um, or at least impo very important for not being depressed. That is, that is fucked up and, and a good way to, to figure it out. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's fucked up, but also better than humans being depressed. So uh yeah. So anyway, it turns out ketamine really yeah. potentially very useful for uh, for stress related um, stress related depression. Okay, okay, okay. And uh, did you okay? So when you were uh, taking, I'm just uh, curious how many like uh, did they take you through like a? Uh, did you have to go through like an ethics course? Oh yeah, like a, Every, everyone has to do a research ethics course. That's like the first thing you do when you go into uh, when you go into like medical research. Okay, so how was did they just give you like the the sides of the argument and protocol. Oh, for this specific set, for this specific set of experiments, no. But you do have to refute. You do have to get that everything approved by an ethics board. 
absolutely everything has to get approved by an ethics board. So you, you submit the protocol, you say what you're going to do. And then the ethics board looks at it and, you know, you have a conversation about like, basically what's the minimal amount of harm you can do to a group of mice in order to uh, actually um, get the research you need to get done, done. And, you know, we, we, we come up with, you know, so, 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 so I wasn't involved once again, wasn't involved in any of this, but, um, but certainly, certainly research going forward, there will be uh, continue to be ethics board approvals for all these things. Yeah. 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 Uh, cool. Cool. Okay. So back to the, so is there any, so with, um, I'm just, I'm just curious. Cause I've, yeah. I like, uh, the, the subject of like, um, like drugs versus like, uh, I don't know if the words homeopathic or like natural, um, ways to is, 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 and I don't know how you would test this with, mice like it'd have to be like human trials i think but like being like when i think of like oh how do you how do you heal from getting you know fucked up you know mentally so to speak or or from stress you know like going outside and and stuff like that like i don't know if uh well certainly certainly like certain things are like really effective like exercise seems to be pretty effective um at, at, uh, at a lot of these things are, but here's the thing. A lot of these things are effective at preventing depression from developing, but aren't necessarily effective at repairing depression that has occurred. Um, and this is one thing that's really important, right? Which is that when these, when, when ketamine returns these dendritic spines to the, to, you know, to, returns the dendritic spines to existence, <laughs> um, regrows them, right? Um, it doesn't stop them from dying off again. Right, so if you take the same mouse and you put it through another stress regimen, it's going to lose those neural connections again. In fact, sometimes they even lose them spontaneously. Is my understanding? I could have that wrong. I'd have to look at the literature again. Um, but the point being that um, it's not obvious that um, you can regrow. It's not known to me, actually. I'll say that you can regrow um, neural spines by exercise dendritic spines by just exercise alone. So it may be that what you have to do is you have to get someone to like, you know, the, the clinical application might be something like, okay, we're going to give you this ketamine dose. And then we're going to have to come up with a bunch of, we may have to come up with a, maybe a second drug to keep the dendritic spines around, or maybe you may have to change your lifestyle in such a way that those dendritic spines don't fall away, figure out ways to reduce stress, um, figure out ways to, you know, of course, that's not always possible for everyone. Some people have like very stressful lives and they have no choice in the matter, right? Um, you know, so some of these things you can th see of diseases of society and, you know, you can talk about how to restructure society to solve these problems. But like, I'm kind of interested in the proximal question, which is instead of how, how do you help someone just help themselves within the contact without having to fully change society in order to make that happen? Right, right, right. I actually, when you were talking about that, like I had the question, like, okay, so it is like, it is, I think on the like individual to like, okay, you're in this situation. What do you do? Um, right with stress like at that point it's like okay exercise uh diet like having uh, uh maybe like friends and i'm thinking like like a su uh, support network and i'm wondering right. if like okay so why would would exercise it's like okay and i could be this this could be like a mistake in in my thinking but like uh, you, you exercise. So you, you, your brains, you know, your organism is like functioning better, your brain's functioning better. So you don't make as many mistakes. And is it the so is it the m mistakes that are? Is it just the cortisol that's like, that's eating up the uh, dendritic? Yeah, th these are important questions, right? And and a lot of the time, these are, these are the same questions we're asking when we're talking about drug targets, right? So it's like, it's like, okay, what is the, we call this a pathway? So what specifically is the pathway by which cortisol interacts with your neurons and causes dendritic spine death? Okay, right. that's the first question. When does that? Yeah, and, yeah, and, and you want well, you want to know cortisol is a molecule that comes in and it hits what receptor or what region, uh, you know, what protein or whatnot, and then it 
causes what cascade of events that leads to the dendrite forming, uh, sorry, dendrite dying off. And the question becomes, how do you block somewhere in that pathway? And then how do you block somewhere in that pathway without messing up something else that's important in your body? Um, because that pathway exists and maybe as is the joke, and I'm not sure if it's a joke, but like we talk about this in biology a lot. I think of so many things as jokes that aren't funny. So yeah, as is the joke kind of uh, like, oh, what, what is that pathway being used for this or this? And the answer is always both probably, um, you know, is this, is, is that molecule you, like, basically if biology can figure out 10 ways to do the same thing, it'll do it. <laughs> you know, like it, 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 there's like, it, 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 biology loves like to come up with like five different ways to do the same thing. So it, and then how to figure out how to make everything, every pathway interconnected and into involved in something else. So detangling that web is really challenging. And that's the process of finding drug targets. Once you find a druggable target, then you're trying to figure out, will I hurt someone really bad if I give, if I create a drug that targets this area and stops this pathway and does that thing. So, um, yeah. you know, one thing is to maybe just drop people, like block the cortisol release itself. Things are, you know, maybe something downstream, what we call downstream of the cortisol. It, it's not obvious. And it's something that really does require, um, you know, that's, we're at the cutting edge there. Like that you're asking the question of like, you know, that, that any scientist would ask and will spend a lot of time in the lab to figure out, um, like, like a lot of this work is in underway. We're yeah. in the process of figuring these things out. Yeah. 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 You could say it's, it's, it's kind of stressful. The it's kind of stressful. <laughs> kind of pending. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Right. Yeah. So, so that's, that's, it's certainly stressful. Um, but it's also, uh, you know, I, I think it's, I think it's a very worthwhile thing. I think, I'll, I think everyone has been touched by someone with the, you know, touched by depression, either per, directly or indirectly. Um, I think it's a pretty common, you know, I, I always say that, like, I don't know very many people who've died. I don't know that many people have died of, uh, like, like, at my age, I don't know that many people have died of heart disease and cancer, but I do know, a lot, like, enough people have died of suicide and car crashes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I actually, like, um, I was thinking, when I was, when I was uh, going to school i was actually i was actually thinking about moving somewhere where it was like the highest rate of uh depression in oh, in, in one california time in the united no oh it was uh it was in uh montana oh. it was one of the cities in it was it's like notorious uh it's the city of uh it's like right outside of it's wherever the U University uh, of Montana is. Um, Montana has the highest depression rate. I, b I believe. Is that Bozeman? What's that? Okay, it's not. It's the. Um, I think Bozeman is the. You know, it could be Bozeman because I flew into uh, Bozeman School at the University of Minnesota. Uh, sorry, University of Montana, and I'm. That's not great to hear. <laughs> I wonder if she knows that. Yeah. Yeah, I was about to. It seemed it seemed like a uh, a good place, but that, I think that's like a lot of. I feel like there's a big part of me, or has been a big part of me that like my life was like constantly just um, like with diet and exercise. It was like just kicking, like trying to. It was more okay. I want to live a fulfilling life, but also like part of that was like you know what positive emotion can I can I bring up in me to keep like depression at, you know, at bay. And I don't think, I think when it, it became less after a while, it became less about keeping depression at bay and just keeping, you know, positive emotion, like going through, through my system. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What did you find to be useful? Um, exercise, if you don't mind. exercise. And I think like, um, like I actually, I believe, uh, like William James type, uh, type positive thinking, you know, uh, affirmations, you know, affirmations or just, or just trying to find, you know, uh, um, what seemed like, you know, bulletproof thought patterns or like, right. or like trying to, you know, you have the choice of picking which thought pathways you, you, um, 
you navigate, I guess. Um, and yeah, th- th- this is an interesting idea. You know, it's it's um, one thing I've been playing with a little bit. Um, I, I was I was in class for uh, I was in a neuroscience oh, class recently. Imagery, imagery too. Pa- imagery. That's been huge for me. What what type of imagery? Um, I think this. Uh, it's 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 hard to explain. It's like uh, bringing up uh, just images that seem very uh, soothing. I don't know how else to to explain it. It's like it's like uh, uh, allowing. Um, it's almost like allowing the aesthetic part of my being to like rise up in me sort of, I guess. Mm. I don't know how else I would, I would explain it exactly. Totally. Well, to touch on something you were saying earlier. Okay. Um, one thing that's been interesting to me to think about recently is that the cortex might be, um, okay. So I was talking to, you know, Max. Yes. I was talking to Max this morning about the idea that we maybe don't have free will, but we have free won't, um, which I thought was really fun to hear someone say, um, which is you don't necessarily get to choose what you will do, but you do get to choose what you won't do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something like that, which isn't totally true. But Yeah, yeah, I don't know how much I, I agree, but it's, it's at least uh, funny. Well, it made me smile. And, and the, thing that, um, the thing that was interesting about that to me was that I had just gotten out of a conversation um, or a brief conversation with uh, Corey Bargman, who's head of the Chen Zuckerberg Institute uh, um, Foundation, or not head, I don't know exactly what her job is, but around here, we all think of her as head on accident, just because she's the one we know from the, uh, from the foundation. And then she's also a professor here uh, of neuroscience at the Rocket Mill University. Um, and she, um, she, I was asking her what she thought about um, this idea that um, about how the, the cortex mediating the midbrain, which is where emotions are largely, um, like affective behavior is largely controlled by the midbrain. Um, affect being like emotions, emotions and affect, pretty similar ways of saying, you know, different ways of saying kind of the same thing. Um, and her, and, and she said that she had a colleague that she was talking to who considers the cortex to be basically an inhibitory layer on top of the midbrain. So the cortex, despite what you think, is normally people think of like the prefrontal cortex or just the cortex in general as like this cognitive area um, of like thought, um, but that maybe a lot of thought actually has to do with inhibition. And a lot of the job of the cortex actually is this in- inhibitory job of like like saying, okay, Mr. Okay, Mr. Angry, you know, you're in angry state. Okay, Mr. Angry midbrain, we're not about to punch that person in the face. Um, you know, and your anger circuit says, I'm going to punch them in the face. And you say, and your, and your cortex says, no, it's not a good job idea for your job or well-being to punch that person in the face. So that like, like our, like our, like animal, like our car cortex in some sense, like, 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 um, like managing our animalistic midbrain, um, our, our mammalian emotional, you know, kind of maybe histrionic kind of midbrain behavior and our cortex really like, you know, is a big part of, you know, not the whole thing. And that's not the whole picture. And, and she was very clear to say that this isn't the whole picture, but it's, I think it is part of the picture. And it's an interesting way to, it's an interesting thing to look out for when we're dealing with the difference between the cortex and the midbrain, because everyone does that all the time, right? They're always thinking about the cortex. <laughs> uh, yeah, so. Oh, yeah. That may only be useful to me, but. <laughs> no, no, that's, I mean, that's, that's when you're, when you're in a, in the sciences, that's, that's kind of like your, you know, that's, that's a, uh, that's a good pastime. I mean, yeah. I think, I think it's a good pastime in, in general, but definitely if, if it's your, uh, if you're, uh, in science. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So then, um, so yeah, that's, 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 uh, so, so, so that's the thought on that. Um, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, would you, do you, do you want to, uh, talk more about what this whole, uh, podcast is? I mean, I could, I sure. could like, like the, the, uh, the depression stuff. I definitely like have, uh, 
more thoughts on that, but we can, we can go back to that. What, what, well, yeah, if you, if you, if there's anything else you want to explore in that space, and my, my only issue is that I don't know that much. I know, I know a few things and I am, as I said, I'm, I'm very new to that field. So a lot of this is super new to me. So I don't have that big of a back catalog of things to talk about in the depression space. Um, beyond some ideas in the world of precision medicine, but I don't even have those dusted off enough to like really have that together. Um, okay. So, okay. Yeah. As far as the podcast, I can definitely talk about that. Um, so the podcast is called solutions. Um, well, it's actually called solutions with Mason Hargrave. I just feel weird saying it when it's, when it's my name, oh. <laughs> um, but my manager insisted That's that I put yeah. Yeah. My manager insisted I put that in there. So, yeah. and uh, my, you know, my manager is also just like, he mainly my editor for the videos, but I think it's more fun to, uh, to call him. Like, like he feels cooler when I call him my manager and I feel cooler when I say I have a manager. So uh, we go with manager for his job title. Yeah. Um, so my manager um, says that, uh, says that, um, uh, said said that I needed to have my name in the title so that it was like more recognizable because solutions doesn't sound enough like a podcast. So, okay. So solutions with Mason Hargrave. Um, I'm basically going to be interviewing professors from my university. I'm, um, I'm at the Rockefeller university, which is not a university most people are familiar with unless they're in biology, in which case they know that we're top in the world. Or I like to say that at least uh, according to the lead in ranking, we have a three Sigma improvement over MIT in terms of citation count and MIT would be the second highest uh, university. Sorry, in terms of PP 10%, which is a different metric than citation count. Um, but uh, it's, it's a really good metric. I think it's out of the proportion of papers that you, out of the papers you publish, what proportion of them are in the top 10% of the, their field by citation count. Um, meaning, uh, meaning an average university would have a PP 10% of 10. Um, and so, and then basically depends on what your university is to figure out what, how, what percentage of papers are in the top 10% by citation count. I don't have it off the top of my head, what Rockefeller is, but it's three standard deviations above MIT, which is all that I care about. We're number one. Um, and so, uh, so any, anyway, um, so, so that's me being cocky about my, yeah, dude, just ratchet, ratchet, uh, ratchet everything up, dude. Yeah, that's right. I, I mean, MIT needs to really step their game up, to be honest with you. I think that's, I think MIT is really lacking. <laughs> yeah, dude. Give, give, give people uh, uh, a metric to like uh, strive for or, or, or a number. That's right. Well, everyone just needs to grow up and be as good as the Rockefeller University. I talk, I, 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 I just like to, I like, I like to be this, like, I, I don't know. I find it fun. I'm like, I'm like not that serious when I say this. But I do like poking fun at the other top universities just to be just, just just for pride purposes. Yeah, it's the only it's the only thing if if uh, if you know the this this if competition if there's anything to be gained in competition might as well like reap it. Yeah, <laughs> plus I did I don't know I. I, this is kind of my sense of humor. I, I act this way with a lot of things. I just like, I just, I just like to poke fun at things like that. Like, and I, and I'm pretty gracious when people poke fun back about it. So like, I don't, I don't really take issue uh, on that. Like, you know, I, I think, I think there's plenty of valid criticisms of, of, of my university to like, to make fun of us for. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take my jabs at MIT who, by the way, didn't accept me to their PhD program. So maybe I'm just salty. Um, so <laughs> uh, when I can, um, uh, yeah, they rejected me twice. Once for undergraduate, once for PhD, once for PhD. Um, but uh, anyway, um, so so anyway, I'm interviewing professors here at the Rockefeller University. Um, a lot of the professors here, um, like historically, ten percent of our professors had get Nobel prizes. Um, we have the most Nobel prizes compared to any. Uh, we have more Nobel prizes than France as a country. Um, <laughs> Like are you this this little plot of land in New <laughs> yeah. York outproduces the entire country of France, um, and so uh, the point here being that um, I have more intellectual I have more biological intellectual resources available to me than the entire country of France, and they're all in a building and we all live in like the same like we all live in the same few buildings together. I'm also poking fun at France. This is fun. Um, yeah, no, that just sounds like a fact. Like yeah, a just fact a fact. Logistics. Um, so point being is that we have some like really top notch professors, the 2020, um, the 2020, uh, 2020 Nobel prize for health, uh, medicine, what was came out of Rockefeller this year, um, which was for the discovery of hep C, I think. Um, so, 
So it's, it's, uh, it's or hepatitis, you know, hepatitis C. Um, so uh, anyway, I, I'm going to be starting interviewing these professors, grad students, postdocs around here, um, largely professors um, about their research and the art of problem solving. So that's, I should have said that at the beginning. My nine, my nine word pitch is solutions is um, solutions is me interviewing scientists about the art of problem solving. Um, okay. We'll, we'll, we'll mark that. The art. Yeah, that's right. Do <laughs> that's the, that's the big punchline. It's like I, I interview professors about the art of problem solving and not just professors. Hopefully I'll branch out eventually, but right now I like have my, my plate full with plenty of professors to interview uh, to start with. And I can fill there's 85 labs. So I can fill up basically a whole year and a half with, um, content from professors without having to interview anyone twice. Um, and so I plan on doing that over the next year and a half is just interviewing as many professors as I can. Um, and yeah, so, uh, uh, the, the, one of my kind of reasons for doing this is here's the big vision, right? The big vision is that I think that, um, I believe, I, I believe in this thing called the innovation stagnation problem. Um, I've coined the phrase, it's called the innovation stagnation problem. And it is that, um, have, do you know what, do you know? Okay. There's two types of curves you should be aware of. Well, you know, of an exponential curve, uh, an exponential curve. Okay. So is that, is that, uh, just things, uh, start decreasing or increasing the, exponentially? The, like the, so, so like the representation of it, the ex, the exponential curve is just like the one you always see where it's like rising all of a sudden. Right. It goes through and it goes way up, right? That's the exponential curve. Is that is that anything close to the Pareto? Uh, yeah, the Pareto distribution is a distribution, not a curve. And the difference of those things are is that the Pareto distribution has this property. Well, actually, does the Pareto distribution? Yeah. So, so the Pareto distribution has the property that the area under the curve is one. Um, this is to say that um, this this is to say that uh, all. The Pareto distribution is also known as the power law distribution. Um, Jordan Peterson coined, it like, likes to use the word Pareto, but really that's just because he learned it in one context. Every, the mathematical general definition is called the power law distribution. Um, and how, how would I put it? Um, so yeah, this is a subtle difference. Okay. So an exponential curve can be of any size. Um, arbitrary size because you're not dealing with probabilities. Uh, probabilities are important. You know, probability you can't have a probability above 100, percent right? Right, right. I think I remember learning that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you can't have a probability. I, I, I've got it put together in my head. This I'll explain it. Okay. You can't have a probability above 100. percent The area under the curve is the total probability of contained the area under the curve is the probability of a region. So if I were to take the region between A and B, so let's say I have a, I have a distribution and I say, I take A and I take B and these are two spots. These are two possible values in between those two values. The, if I take the area under the curve between, hold on, this is what we'll do. All right. Got the vision. Okay, I don't know why it's saying that we have uh, four minutes on the Zoom meeting, but if we uh, like have to, we can either jump on a different Zoom meeting or, or whatever. Yeah, we'll, okay. we'll work it out. That's really strange. I don't know why they're doing that. But so a distribution. So we'll draw your favorite distribution, which is the Pareto distribution or the power law distribution. <laughs> right, so let's say, let's say I take um, between here and here, A, B. So this little piece I can take out
right? So I take that little piece here and that, that little piece represents the probability of being between A and B. So if I take a value, if I take a, if I randomly choose a value for using this distribution, right? A distribution gives me the a ran, you know, I can take a random sample from this distribution. A sample is just like a number pulled from the distribution. So so if in this case this were um, Pareto distribution comes from the citation count, citation counts. So and in this were it, let's say that this were having um, the maximum number um, or you know or actually we'll do. Yeah. So if actually, we won't call this citation counts, but we'll say this, um, call this time or size of earthquakes. Right? Most earthquakes are really small and you don't even notice them at all. And a very small number of them are really, really big. Right? So if I were to choose a random earthquake that has happened, um, the area, the probability, the area under this curve, which uh, curve, right? This, the area of this region of the graph would be the probability of getting an earthquake that's between A and B level of power, right? So that that's what a distribution. That's what a that's what a distribution does, and um, so that notice that this number can't be above one hundred percent, right? It has to be, so it could be thirty percent. Let's say let's say thirty percent of the time. Um, earthquakes are between A and B size and power, but it can't be, it can't be bigger. It can't be bigger than hundred percent. Right. So we just, we just call that we, instead of saying it's 30%, we say it's 0 0.3. And so all possible earthquakes happen to happen, have to happen under the distribution. So the, the area under the entire curve or the area under the entire distribution has to be one. It can't be bigger than one because that would be above hundred percent. And then that wouldn't make sense. Does okay. that make sense? Um, okay, so. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, so does the the uh, the area underneath does the uh, th th law the Pareto distribution, uh, what you call it, does yeah. that touch the the line the the. Uh, Y axis or the yeah, X axis. It gets axis. infinitely yeah. close to the line. At, okay, but it ends up equaling. Does it? But if you equal yeah, if you take the if you take if you take the the, the the if you take the integral from here off to infinity, it would be equal to one. So the integral of the Pareto distribution from zero to infinity is equal to one. Can't hear you. Sorry. Can you hear me? Wait, can you talk now? Hello. Yeah. Great. Got it. Okay. So. All right. Okay. Great. So, uh, here, here, here's here's the real. Uh, yeah. So so yes, the integral from zero to infinity on this under this curve is one. That is the area under the whole curve is still one, and that's just because. Um, yeah, and that, that's, this is something called a heavy tail distribution. So it doesn't have an average. That's the weird part is it doesn't have a mean, but it does have a, um, it does have a, but that's a whole, that's a whole other thing. Heavy tail distributions are weird, but it does in fact have a, um, oh, oops. Um, but it does have a, um, you know, area, which is one. So there you go. Uh, and that's what a distribution is. Now, what a curve is, is a curve can have any size under it. And so, for instance, um, we were talking about the exponential curve. And the exponential curve is more, just, more than anything just like a shape. And the shape of the exponential curve is something like this. Right? So it's, it looks like... It looks like it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger with time. So, so I think a lot of people think that this is the curve of technology we're on. Like everyone thinks that we're on this like 
massively improving technological situation, right? Where tech is just going to get better and better and better and better and better. And things, things are just improving, improving, improving. And what I actually think um, technological progress for humans looks like is this. Okay. Because that's, that's the impression I was under. I think it looks like this, which is oh. called a, um, actually, I'll make it a little bit better. So first of all, that's one that's called the sigmoid curve. And when you put a bunch of sigmoid curves together, it looks like this. Is that still in the? Yeah, yeah, still, still so, uh, the bottom part's not in frame, but I got there. Well, yeah, the general shape is, I'm gonna just erase and you can see. But the general okay, yeah, 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 because the first, the first sig, what was it called? The, the first one's called the sigmoid, just one of them. And then when you frame, put them together, it's this. Right, it's a bunch of it's scalloping, and if you were to zoom in on the sigmoids curve here, it would look indeed just like a exponential. Um, and so I think we are mistaking what is a sigmoid curve for an exponential curve, and this is a big problem. Okay, um, how 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 long do you think the the um... well, first of all, I'm like, okay, what what would what causes that if that's the uh well I, I i'm not sure what causes it this is a hypothesis and i'm not really fully married to it yet but i but i'm playing around with the idea yeah. and and so in evolution we know this happens this is called um this is called punctuated equilibrium if you look at the fossil records um look at the fossil records you'll notice that actually evolution isn't like this gradual constant process it happens in really fast bursts and then it stops happening and then it happens again really quickly and then it stops happening and then it happens again really quickly. It's certainly happening. It is. But the fact of the matter is that sometimes the evolution is evolution is more explosive than other times. And so it ends up in the fossil record looking like you have these big explosions of populations, like the most famous of which is called the Cambrian explosion. And you can look at the Cambrian explosion. You can see that all of a sudden a bunch of new types of biological beings came into, like came into existence in a very short period of time. Um, so this is, and this is a property of dynamical systems called a punctuated equilibrium. Um, meaning, meaning it's normally flat, but sometimes it grows really fast. And when it grows, it looks like a sigmoid. It looks like that S shaped okay. curve. Okay. Okay. I'm wondering just a thought was like, oh, is that, is that what, uh, like you have natural, like if you're exercising, you have you have plateaus that happen, yep. right? That's a punctuated equilibrium, right? Okay, uh, and and you sort of have to, um, and I don't know, and, and then people like try and like make sure that that uh, doesn't happen, or that it is punctuated, and eventually there is more more progress like happening. You know, you know what I mean, like right. like and, making and eventually, sure that, eventually that, that won't be true. Right, you eventually get to a point where that just isn't true anymore, and you don't, um, you don't continue to have uh, progress. Right, eventually in your life, it's guaranteed that you'll eventually fall okay. off um, of, of doing this. It's a hundred percent guaranteed. Right, and so and so your goal is to break as many plateaus as you can and get through enough of those cycles, and you know, kind of reach escape velocity from your current plateau which requires often you doing more strenuous exercise, a different type of exercise, changing up your diet. There's a number of different things you can do in order to solve that problem, right? And so I think roughly that we're, we're in a phase, we're in a phase of exponential growth, but we're tapering off to the end of one, actually. I think- I, I, I would agree on a, on a different, just, just phenomenal, like I've, I've seen like, I would call them like signs, but yeah. Well, think about it like this, right? One, one, one thing, for instance, is like that first iPhone you got, like, or whatever smartphone you got. It's like, wow, that's such a huge improvement over my Motorola <laughs> Razor. I, I was going to say the Razor. Right. It's like such an improvement over my Motorola Razor. It's like, wow, holy crap. That's so good. And now like the difference between my current phone and the latest iPhone is like, okay, big deal. So what? 
Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering about, and also it seems like people are going back to like, like, uh, like realizing how much they don't need almost right. is what I've, I've seen. And that's actually like, like, uh, part of it's like, holy crap, this is, this is, you know, not bad for the right. spirit, you know? Like, yeah, so I think there's yeah. a certain amount of, and I think this is, this may be one of the, you may be pointing out one of the mechanisms by which this happens, which is that people are genu generally satisfied with the amount of technology we currently have. And this happened once before this happened. There's a, there's a, there's, there's, there's a Neolithic version of this, which is that stone cool tools got created by Homo habilis, right? Homo habilis, a precursor to, um, uh, you know, or actually I, I think they have a common ancestor with Homo sapiens. Um, are, uh, how would you say they invent stone tools and then stone tools like don't change through the hominid world since Homo habilis for like a very long time. And that was oh. the, right. So, so, so you're, they're smart enough to invent stone tools for like, and start smart and, and then later smart enough to invent fire. But what, like you don't go past that for another another thousand, many thousands of years? So, so do you think that's a uh, a a problem that kind of needs to be like uh, nipped or? Well, I think it probably needs to be. Uh, basically, I think we need to extend the exponential run run for as long as we can, because I think a lot of our financial institutions, a lot of our countries, a lot of our cultural assumptions are all based around um, exponential growth. Um, Eric Weinstein or Weinstein. I'm always not sure which one he wants me to call him. Um, Weinstein. Weinstein. Eric Weinstein. Eric Weinstein. I don't know why. Steen yeah, Weinstein. He likes Weinstein. He likes Weinstein. It's Steen. Um, Eric Weinstein um, um, really talks about the embedded growth obligation quite a bit which is the fact that institutions and whatnot are, are reliant upon the idea that things are going to continue growing, that the pie is going to continue growing. Um, and, you know, if that isn't true, I think we're going to see a lot of collapsing of a lot of, like, I think we're going to see a lot of problems. Um, so one question is how do we actually manifest the exponential thing that we've been assuming is going to happen, which I don't think is going to happen at our current rate. And we better figure some things out very quickly for how to improve or how to solve the innovation stagnation problem. That's what I call the innovation stagnation problem. It's the problem that innovation stagnates eventually if you do not like, if you let things run their natural course. Um, so I don't know exactly how to solve that problem. Um, but I think roughly I have to like spark as much innovation as I can and innovation comes in the form of solutions. So thus the podcast is called solutions and it's uh, the big grand vision is to solve the innovation stagnation problem. I have some hair schemes for doing that, but, um, you know, at the end of the day, the main point of this, one thrust of this is just to interview interesting academics who have, I think, solutions to really difficult problems, but who have not brought them into the private sphere and turned them into technologies yet, necessarily. Some of them have. Um, but, you know, just kind of point out what solutions exist out there to spark people to be like, wait, wait a minute. That's really important to know. Why don't we create this solution based on that observation? Or, you know, and, and, and why don't you look at how these people who solve problems professionally go about solving problems? And, you know, and this, in this way, we can also talk about how the, how the um, scientific method actually works, not the way everyone learns how it works in high school, which is like not actually how scientists do science. Okay, so do you, do you have a uh, uh, a better uh, a better formulation for for uh, the scientific method that doesn't that w I guess something that that might be uh, accessible? Yeah, I do. Or, I do. It I can even I, be I, I've coined this. I have a new. I have a new thing. So I, I have, so my so if you want Masonisms, one of them is the one of them is the innovation stagnation problem, and my next Masonism is what I call the four F's of problem solving. Um, the four F's being finding a problem worth solving, then framing it such that it appears solvable. And then thirdly, figuring out the solution to the problem. And then finally funding your solution to the problem. Okay. Okay. Um, and that's, I think, actually how science works. Um, in fact, ex except, except there's a caveat, which is a kind of a fun one it was just people are always writing grants about their last project to fund their next project so sometimes the funding comes first 
Right. right. So um, kind of depends on where you are, but funding gets in there somewhere. Uh, and it always has to come in somewhere. Um, unless you're solving a math problem, in which case you don't really need that much funding other than just getting yourself a job at a university. Um, which I appreciate the math people a lot, um, but I won't be interviewing very many of them because I think the innovation stagnation problem has very little to do with fundamental mathematics. Okay, okay. And I know, I know like one, one math guy and that's, well, I no, I know like two, but yeah, yeah. It seems like the, 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 the crowds that I'm around, it's, it's either, uh, well, I like the, uh, awakening from the, the meaning crisis people. Have you, have you been, uh, talking with them? I've been hanging out with some of these people. Yeah. 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 They're fun. They're fun. Do you know Mark yet? I don't know. I bad. I'm I'm bad with figuring out names. I'm good at. The, I like the icons. The icons help me a lot. So when people change their icon and their name at the same time, I'm just like, I can't. That's so mean. Don't do that. People out there on Discord, do not change your icon and name at the same time. It's really fucked. <laughs> Dude, I actually I uh, guilty last night. You changed your icon, but you you kept your name, right? No, I. <laughs> I, I changed it. So I changed it to, uh, well, I changed it one time and I changed it, uh, just the, the icon. And then, uh, last night, I don't know why, I don't know if you've ever seen pride and prejudice. Yeah. I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I just freaking love that movie for, for some reason it, it sticks in my head. So I changed my name to, uh, uh, Mr. Wickham and put a d d picture of him for God knows why. But, and uh, yeah, yeah, so. Well, regardless. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but. Um, so you're one of them. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're the well, one. Try not to be. But. Well, people do that and then they're like, I can't believe you can't remember, don't remember who I am. I'm like, dude, only so many people have voices perfectly distinctible, distinctive enough for me to be like, oh yes, obviously that's this person. Yeah, 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 for sure. So. Anyway. For sure, yeah, um, yeah. So, so, so basically, basically, my 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 method for wanting to solve this innovation stagnation problem is is roughly to build a community around solving problems and around kind of figuring out what is the way to solve problems. I and I think with my four Fs, I have an idea, but like I think I think there I'm open to other alternative ideas for how you go about problem solving, and that's part of the whole reason why I'm going to be interviewing these professors is because these are people who have solved a lot of problems in their lives. And so I'm interested in the question as to how you go about solving problems. I have a, I, I have a belief as to how you might do it, but, um, but these people have solved a lot of problems and they're always looking for a problem worth solving. Mm -hmm. And then they're always trying to figure out, you know, okay, how do you find a good problem? How do you frame that problem? And, you know, and, and then, and then how did you end up actually going about solving it? And I think it's a much more organic and human process than like the very robotics hypothesis and then develop an experiment that tests your hypothesis. I mean, a lot of people are doing exploratory um, um, experiments where they're doing an experiment without a hypothesis. They don't even know what's going to happen. They're like, <laughs> so many things could happen. I have no clue. Let's just try it. You know, and they're doing it totally, totally hypothesis blind. And that's not wrong all the time. Sometimes you just need to, you know, before you have a hypothesis, sometimes you need to make an observation, right? Like the observation often comes before the hypothesis. Right, Galileo saw Isaac Newton saw things drop before he came up with the hypothesis about gravity. Right, sure. Isaac Newton saw an apple drop, and he goes, "Wait." So the data collection came before the hypothesis. In that case, sure, sure. So it's not nearly as like I think it's very false the way. I mean, we we I think it's useful, but it's very like to, to think about it sometimes in that hypothesis driven way, but I think it's also not always how I see science being done. And um I don't think it's science is really defined by that sort of a thing. I think it's solve a, a science I think science is roughly trying to figure out what the laws of the universe are or laws of uh, laws of a given system are or how a system works. It's a reverse engineering process. It's not building systems. It's figuring out how a system that you've just been given. You've been given a box and figuring out how that box works. And that's what science is. Okay. Okay. It's, it's that, a reverse that, engineering right. process. Right. 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 Yeah, it sounds it sounds almost more. Uh, um, uh, I don't know why I'm thinking like top down. Um, it, yeah, 
yeah, well, it's actually really bottom up in a lot of ways, right? It's, 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 I'm going to make these observations and figure out what the rules are from these observations. Um, which is, I think physicists make it look sound like a lot of the time it's coming up with a theory and then trying to figure out how that theory, you know, whether or not that theory fits the data. And like, that's only very recent. Um, most of the history of physics has been a history of observations and then creating theories from those observations. Like Fermi did a bunch of, uh, not Fermi, Fermi. Um, uh, not Fermi. Um, Faraday did a bunch of experiments on electromagnetism before Maxwell ever created Maxwell's equations. And Maxwell didn't even create Maxwell's equations. Maxwell created like 12 different equations that got condensed into Maxwell's equation by a different mathematician later down the road, but that's not, that's a whole different story. Oh, right, 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 right. Those, those are, the, that's in books. That's in books. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, okay. That's, man. That's, that's, that's a, there's a lot uh, going on. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so then the, the kind of goal is to funnel that into, funnel this into a community of people who are interested in problem solving. And then for me to, I have a pretty good sense as to what types of people are um, useful for solving problems, like very quickly. If, so, so for, first I want to, as a community, identify a problem worth solving so we can do it as a team. You can identify a problem worth solving. And then I want to pull the right number of people to help frame the problem into a group. And then I want to find, so I want to find a group. I want to like, see if we can crowdsource a like startup, like a startup incubator. You know what I mean? Like, can we get a bunch of people together to like solve problems that are worth solving and like identify and solve problems. So I, like, I want to, I want to see if it's possible to do a like distributed startup incubator through a community of people who like a podcast, who are drawn to the podcast. And like the nice thing is that the podcast ends up being a filtration mechanism. Because if you like the way that I think, if you like the way that I deal with things and handle things and talk about things, then you're likely to work well with me, at, at work, work well with me. And then we're likely to work well together in order to, you know, basically if it's a community of people who can rally around a thing, then they're like more likely to get along. And I saw this happen multiple times um, around podcast communities over COVID, which is groups that form around a podcast actually have a lot of coherence. Yeah, well, of... or uh, like the, the thing I'm thinking of is like having a, uh, roommates and having like a chore chart. Right. Or like, or like a group of people, right? Right. And, and so, that, yeah. well, yeah. So there's a lot of coherence around people who like form, form these communities around podcasts because like people who like the same podcast are similar people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like the it's it's like the the equivalent of like the uh, the the pillar. It gives you it it definitely gives you a if you're listening to like certain podcasts like the Verveki people or or it just gives you a common like uh, language and that's huge, huge. And so by having a solutions oriented podcast, I think I can lead a lot of solutions oriented conversations or like generate a bunch of solutions oriented conversations. Um, and in so doing, maybe um, do my part in solving the innovation stagnation problem. Um, one big part is I think to get out of the innovation stagnation problem, you have to recognize that it's happening and that like Moore's, Moore's law isn't going to run forever and computers aren't just going to solve all their problems. Um, and, you know, that, that we really do need to come up with, we do need to be, make some more fundamental breakthroughs if we're going to, uh, to you know, bo both, both at the scientific and engineering levels, we need to like, so like, start solving some real problems. And a lot of that's going to have to do, a lot of that's going to be government related. We're going to need the government to approve a lot of these solutions that we're going to need to implement. And, you know, I don't know exactly what needs to be done yet, but that's why I'm searching for problems worth solving and just going to try to solve them. Like that's all I can do, right? Like the best I can do as a human is to try to find solve problems and solve them and lead a team to do that. So like, I'm going to do that. That's what I have to do. It's the best thing I can contribute as a human. So I'm going to try to contribute that. and by God, that, that, that gives me meaning to my life. So why not do it? Yeah, dude. Freaking like, that's it. Push it, dude. Yeah. 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 Um, dude, thank you. Thank you like so much for, for, uh, talking to me. I don't know. Um, we could, uh, I mean, I still like the depression stuff is still kind of yeah. like, uh, do you have anything else you want to say about that? Well, I was, I was just thinking like how much, um, well, like 
there's there's something getting on the when you when you start uh getting on the uh uh upward spiral of solving problems that does a huge number for like for for um like sense of like uh it's almost like self-respect but it's it's like uh physiological more totally yeah yeah I know that for myself is if I'm kind of it, like, I do the same thing in my, in my daily life as I identify little pain points on things that just like, aren't good for my daily. Like recently I realized that one of my biggest problems was I was getting my phone too early in the day. So what have I done now? I put my phone in my living room when I go to bed. Right. And that way I don't, I, I'd have to, I'd have to do something really dumb in the morning. I would have to get out of my bed and I have to go in, walk all the way to my living room to get my phone. And that makes me feel stupid. So I don't do it. So, so I had a problem. I, I identified it was worth solving. I framed the problem in such a way that I was like, okay, my, my big problem was like, I'm not getting out of bed on time. It's like, okay. So what am I doing when I'm in the bed? It's like, okay, I'm on my phone. Okay. So what do I do to solve that? Like, so, so I frame the problem in terms of that it has something to do with my phone. And it's like, okay, well, that, that framed it such that it seems solvable. I can, I can solve a problem that has to do with my phone. I just don't let myself take it. Okay, well, you're going to take it if it's on your desk. You keep proving that to yourself that you do that. So where can you put it that you won't grab it? It's like, well, I'll have to put it somewhere else. Well, where else can I put it? Like, put it in my living room. Okay, problem solved. Uh, I don't have to fund this one because it's just not, not a solution that costs money. And um, now I'm done. So that, 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 that was my little, and that made my week so much better last week. You know, it's like huge, huge solution. Right now, I'm not going to bed on time. One thing might be blue light. I'm going to get some blue light goggles. I don't know, dude. <laughs> Dude. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually, I feel like that's, that's a, uh, I don't know why I feel like it's a big thing, uh, right now, people not going to like sleep on time. I've, I've heard that from, from, I guess it's just, I guess people go through their own, uh, uh, punctuated, uh, equilibrium. uh, equilibriums. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they have, uh, their times where they're getting to bed on time and then, uh, um, but but yeah, that I, I think a lot of it is that is that my like reason to go to bed on time was because I would have to get up on time in order to do something social. Like I had a social pressure to do that. Like I had to go into work, but now that I don't have to go into work, it causes me problems. Like it was one thing when yeah. I knew at every day yeah. I got into work at eight I, or I would get into work at nine and then I would get coffee with the, you know, coffee with the lab guys and we'd go and we'd drink our coffee and then we'd go back to work and we worked a certain number of hours and we'd eat lunch together at 12. And then like, I had like this routine that I had with all these friends. And then it was like, now I don't have that routine. And like, like it means that my sleep time isn't, feels arbitrary. It's like, okay, you could go to bed whenever because nothing's happening tomorrow anyway, you know? And you feel like, <laughs> tomorrow's just another day in my box here in Manhattan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's almost when it's like, most like, okay, what am I, uh, going to uh force myself to do what's the minimum like how am i going to get the uh basically the minimum done so i feel uh better going to sleep than you know i did waking up or going to sleep feeling feeling good i guess totally yeah yeah and that's 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 like that's i mean as far as like that's like my problem i just try and like like that's probably that's where a lot of my focus is i feel like right right and you know i think i think solving your proximal problems is a big part of learning how to problem solve in general like i always i I like the phrase uh, tend to the garden you can touch yes yeah so you know and so like currently my garden size is like my university. And it's like, okay, I can touch, I can, I can like, at least I can like do this thing in the context of my university and like maybe in the context of the discords I operate in and like, maybe I can expand the size of the garden I can touch, but at the very least tend to the garden you can touch and like, make sure that's handled first. Yeah. 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 That's, 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 that's cool. Yeah. I believe in the expand outward method where you kind of start you know it's well i mean i'm 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 totally borrowing from peterson right it's like it's like very much so like start with yourself set get your bedtime right like clean your room first and then like maybe you can get your living room painted painted you know or whatever and you can go from there and so i think there's a lot of that going on i see that you have your room painted 
Yes, yes, yes. Did you so, paint it? So somebody, somebody uh, did it. Yeah. <laughs> somebody solved that. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I I only mentioned this because I recently painted my room because I was like, hmm, I wanted my room painted, so I did that. And I was got pretty happy with that. Dude. I don't know. I'm rambling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So maybe I think here. I think we'll uh we can call it call it good. Cool. Um, and then yeah, yeah. If uh if you ever fucking want to toss around ideas or or what whatever this this uh. This platform's this platform's beautiful. Open. That's great.